Let us turn to Mr. Benjamin Perks, Head of Campaigns and Advocacy in the Division of Global Communications and Advocacy at UNICEF headquarters in New York. Mr. Perks leads public and policy advocacy on the development and protection of children. He has extensive experience in human rights diplomacy, particularly in UNICEF in both the Republic of North Macedonia and the Republic of Montenegro. His work spans various continent, uh, countries, including Georgia, Kosovo, Afghanistan, India, and Albania. Notable achievements include coordinating the back to school campaign in Northern Afghanistan, which enrolled millions of children, especially girls, into school and for many for the first time. He has also focused on demobilization child soldiers, improving conditions for children in state care, addressing child poverty, and advocating for disability inclusion. Mr. Perks is a senior fellow at the University of Birmingham, which researches education policy on character, social, and emotional development of children, and an associate faculty member at Oxford University Department of Social Policy and Innovation. He is a companion ending child trauma and will publish his Attachment Revolution book in 2025. Looking forward to reading that. <laughs> Um, you have the floor, Mr. That, that photo is a few kilograms ago, and I apologize for, <laughs> for any disappointment caused. Um, thank Absolutely. You, <laughs> thank you very much for the, the introduction, um, and thank you uh, for colleagues from the Permanent Mission of Malaysia, um, the Doe Institute, and IFFD for hosting this, uh, this great session today. I, if we could, oh, I, I've got it, right, there it is. Um, I, I want to talk about another mega trend that is a positive mega trend. I'm not sure it's just if you could really call it a mega trend, but maybe we're the first generation in history to be really mega cognitive, to really think about the way we parent, you know, to be aware of, um, of the emotional and social development of our children in a way that we never were before. But to also recognize the intergenerational nature of that, to recognize that some things may have been great in our own childhood and some things not, and we can improve on that to have better outcomes for our own children. Why do I think this is a mega trend? Well, here in the United States, there's a $46 billion a year industry on giving parents tips, giving them guidance, and the conversation about parenting. In India, one parent parenting app that promotes evidence-based knowledge on parenting it's got 30 million subscribers. And if you go in a bookshop anywhere from uh, Cape Town to, uh, to, to, uh, to South Korea to Saudi Arabia, anywhere else in the world, you will find nonfiction uh, shelves packed with books about parenting, trauma, mental health, healing, all of these things that add up to the same, to the same thing. And it has revolutionized, I think, the way that we think about childhood globally. And this is a huge opportunity for us and a couple of things that we've learned obviously are that this you know and everybody knows this in the room that this first few years of life are so powerful in determining our emotional social cognitive development uh, and to setting the way that we will see the world live our lives and contribute to our family our community our society throughout the whole life lifespan uh, and a couple of the things that we've learned are that children are not born and then form relationships. They're born into relationships. They are born recognizing the voice of their mother, and they will do anything to hear that voice. They will move towards um, a, par a parent or a caregiver for loving attachment and the deprivation of that loving attachment, which is much more common than we think for preventable reasons, has a huge cost for children because children safety is not just um, sorry um, violence uh, threat is not just the presence of violence it's the absence of love and we know in terms of nurturing that children are asking a hundred questions an hour from the moment they're born often through glancing and babbling and eventually through language and it's the, res the response of the parents to those questions and later on the preschool to those questions that determine and power the brain growth and the, the way that the child sees, uh, sees the world. And this provides enormous opportunities for policymakers, for human rights activists and everybody that loves children, which hopefully, hopefully is most of us. 
But there is a huge threat that we are now aware of in a way that we were not before, and that is uh, adverse childhood experiences, including physical neglect, physical violence, uh, emotional neglect, emotional violence, often, not always, often transmitted intergenerationally, unwittingly, and unintentionally, and they are preventable. But let me just um, talk to you a minute about the prevalence of those, because for most of recent history, we have thought that the prevalence of people affected by these kind of risks is one or two percent of our society, and we got that so wrong. It was covered in plain sight because of taboo and shame and stigma, but now we know it's much more prevalent than we ever thought before. So we, we look across countries, across the world, and you know there are many other countries that have had similar studies, um, violence against children studies and others. They show that more than half of us have experienced one of those adverse adversities on the prior page, and 13% of us have experienced four or more. And the average classroom, the average parliament, the average prevalence in a population is something like this. The majority of people have experienced some form of adversity. But the people at the very back of the classroom with three or four adverse childhood experiences are much greater risk of almost every single well-being outcome, where it's physical health, mental health, addiction, um, propensity to be involved with violence as a victim or a perpetrator, trafficking, uh, gang recruitment, and many other well-being indicators are much, much likely to do worse. And this is something that is correlated across societies. This is data from routine surveillance of states in the US, but you find similar outcomes in multiple countries across the world, across continents, across cultures. This is not culturally specific. It is a neurobiological reality affecting every community in the world. It's not a them problem anymore. It's an us problem, and it really is time for us to act. Even if people are not interested in human rights, there is an economic cost to this because we estimate about 8% of GDP, the very conservative estimate globally is lost each year. In North America and Europe alone, 1.3 trillion is spent each year just on the health outcomes of adverse child experiences, not the things related to crime or security or mental health that I mentioned, just the physical health consequences. Conversely, we know from multiple studies that early investment, particularly in parenting programs, yields a vast return. Program Programs that can prevent adverse childhood experiences cost a fraction of what we spend in responding to them later on in the life cycle. This is why we need to invest early. Um, so one of the things that we are, um, one, perhaps the most significant accelerator for prevention of adversity and for ensuring that every child grows up safe and loved our parenting programs, evidence-based parenting programs. 25% of uh, countries uh, globally report that they have evidence-based parenting programs reaching a significant percentage of the population. Those programs focus on normally on visits to the household, sometimes on group sessions, sometimes backed up by uh, information online or on mobile phones but they look at optimizing opportunities for child development, building the attachment between the, relation, between the child and the parent, helping the parent to understand how to play. We sometimes forget that people that grow up in neglectful homes or homes with high levels of stress on education performance don't play. And they're adults who don't know how to play. They feel awkward, but that can be addressed through, for example, a home visit and a conversation with an expert. Increasing um, support also for health and nutrition through parenting programs. Often parenting programs are embedded within health visiting systems. And the reason, one of the reasons we have to celebrate is that last year a WHO-led, UNICEF-supported um, meta-analysis of parenting programs uh, with 435 randomized control trials from across 65 countries 
showed that parenting programs are evidence to improve nurturing care outcomes, to improve development outcomes, to prevent maltreatment, all things that they intended to do, but they do one thing that wasn't an intentional part of parenting programs, they improve mental health. We don't know why, but we have a guess. Maybe it's because love heals. A parent who has not grown up in a loving context but forms an attachment with their child is going through a healing process. There is also, of course, the fact that having somebody show up and help you to have a structured approach and a st strategic approach to your parenting is also something that is a tremendous uh, relief for, um, for stressed out parents who, who parenting doesn't come naturally to. I want to leave you with a revolutionary idea. Um, in the 1980s, the UN, UNICEF, WHO, governments all around the world decided they wanted to dramatically end, dramatically reduce child mortality. They created a sharp focus on increasing vaccine coverage. In 1980, vaccines only covered 20% of the world population. They increased it to 80% in, in 10 years. Uh, oral rehydration salts and growth monitoring and breastfeeding, two aspects of nutrition support, were rolled out as universal norms. There was a big argument about whether we, should, whether we can really have such a sharp focus or should we just work on everything at the same time. This sharp focus reduced child mortality by 61% within two decades. And of course, it changed all the other things in the world as well related to child and maternal health and, 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 and child development because we no longer lived in a world where it was acceptable that children would die of preventable death. Could we now, our generation, imagine a child development revolution where we aim for every child to grow up safe, loved, and nurtured by delivering three simple, affordable, doable interventions? Parental leave at a very minimum in line with World Health Organization guidelines on, on, on six months for um, for mother and four months for, for, for father, but preferably longer. Parenting programs, evidence-based parenting programs for every family on the planet, and every three to six-year-old to have a place in early childhood education. This sounds like a dream, but it's possible if we work together to achieve it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh